Last time, actually last to last time, we coded the player movement so the player can hop around the map. And then we added fall damage so the player won't hop around as much. But look at the poor guy now. Aw, oh, I know just the thing you need. No. No, no, that's for the next video, probably. Today, we'll code interaction. Hey, I'm Nagi, and I hope you've got some popcorns and a notebook ready, because this video is going to be a long one. Before we start, let's check up on the homework I gave you in the last video. Hmm, no response. Well, I held my side of the deal and coded a simple but functional game over screen. The first thing I did to achieve this was to move all the UI related code over to a control node with its own script. Then I added a panel to work as the game over screen and added a few nodes to it, mainly the two buttons to restart and quit the game. In the player script, I updated the hurt function, shifting all the old code to the UI script and created a function to call when the health goes below 1. This sets a flag variable that is used to decide whether to execute all the movement code. The show game over function just, well, shows the game over panel and makes the mouse visible so the player can select one of the two buttons. The buttons have their press signals connected to the functions that restart or quit the current scene. Now, whenever the player health drops to zero, we see a proper game on the screen. Alright, time to code the thing you clicked the video for. Oh, by the way, if you've already watched the older interaction video, this video doesn't offer a ton of new stuff, but there are some notable differences in the code to make it work for Gloat 4. If you only wish to check out those differences, check out these timestamps, or if you chill, feel free to hang around the whole video. Either way, there's probably gonna be timestamps for things if publishing Nagi doesn't get too lazy. Come on, I'm tired. So, here's the plan. First, we'll create the system for the player to detect interactable objects like doors, levers, reuse jokes. Wait, what? The detection will be achieved using a recast. Then, we'll work on an interactable class which we'll use or extend to create a few different things to interact with. Okay, enough talk. Let's code some sh Let's start by going over to the file system in the corner here. I know, a bit weird, but I think the importance of an organized project structure goes a long way. Here, you can see I've separated all the different game mechanics into their own folders. Now, I can't say for sure if this is the best way to organize your project files, but from my experience, having game mechanics in self-contained folders makes it quite easy to transfer them over to different projects, if you wish to do so. Anyway, I'll create a folder and name it Interact. This will store most of the code we write in this video. After that, I'll create a new scene, select its root type as the other node, and search for Raycast 3D. I'll select it and then rename the root to Interact Ray. With the node selected, I'll go over to the inspector and set its target position to 0, 0, and negative 4. I'll save the scene in the Interact folder. Then, in the player scene, with the head node selected, I'll instantiate the Interact Ray scene. Now, to help the player aim the camera towards interactable objects, we'll need a small marker on the screen, commonly known as a crosshair. For that, I'll select the UI node in the player scene and add a texture rec node. I'll rename it to crosshair and drag it all the way to the top to make sure it's rendered behind all the other UI elements. Lastly, I'll set the texture to this image I made in GIMP, resize the texture rec to fit the image, and then set the anchor preset to center of the screen. Now, to add functionality to the raycast, I'll go back to the interact ray scene and attach a script to the scene root, saving it in the interact folder as well. In the script, I'll define the physics process function, and in it, I'll check if the raycast is colliding and print a message to the console if it does. Running the game, well, sure, it does work, but it's hard to tell when it detects and when it doesn't. Let's add a visual prompt to show whenever the ray detects something. I'll start by adding a label node and rename it to prompt. From the inspector, I'll set its text to this and the horizontal alignment to center. From the viewport, I'll set its anchor preset to horizontal center wide so it shows nicely even with longer text. I'll go to the theme overrides and set the font outline color to black, outline size to 4 and font size to 32. I'll also set the position along Y to 600. The text we set in the inspector is just a placeholder. Let's set its actual value from the code. I'll set the text to an empty string at the start of the physics process function and do something else when it's colliding. Okay, this is a much better indicator of the interact ray. Recasts provide a get collider function that's useful for getting a reference to the object it's detecting and calling functions or reading data from it. I'll update the code to store the reference to the collider. Then I'll read the name of the collider and set it as a prompt text. Cool, one step closer to the result we want. But there's a hurdle to tackle. 
we want each interactable object in the game to have its own custom message. Now, one way to achieve this would be to write a separate script for each object with its own logic to handle the interaction, most of which would be the same anyway. The other method is to have a standard script that works for each object, but can also be extended if needed. And yes, this is the method we are going to go with for obvious reasons. And the reason being because I want to. I'll go to the script view and create a new script. Use the empty template and save it as interactable.gd in the interact folder. In this script, I'll extend from the collision object 3D, define the class name to be interactable, and define an export variable to show the prompt message with the default value set to interact. The reason I'm extending the script from collision object 3D is because this way we can attach the script to either of the nodes that extend from the collision object 3D class. Back in the interact ray script, I'll add an if statement to check if the collider is an interactable and set the prompt text to its message. Now, to test it out, let's create some interactables. I'll create a new scene with the static body 3D root, rename it to button and copy a mesh object I created in Blender into the scene. If you don't have a 3D model handy, you can always find all the project files from the link in the description. I'll rename the mesh to mesh instance, cause why not? Lastly, I'll add a collision shape and set it to a cube that fits the mesh and save the scene in the root folder. Oh, and don't forget to attach the interactable script to the button. Now, all we need to do is go to the main scene, instantiate the button a couple of times, give each a unique prompt message from the inspector, and run the game. You should see each button show its own prompt message as expected. Now that we can detect the interactable objects, let's code the part that interacts with them. In the interactable script, I'll define a new function called interact that takes a body as its parameter and prints a nice message to the console. In the interact ray script, right after setting the prompt message, I'll check if an interact input is pressed and call the collider's interact function, passing the owner to it. The owner here would be the player node. Before testing it out, let's quickly add the interact action to the input map. I'll set it to the E key. Testing out the game, we can interact with the buttons and it prints to the console. Great! But what if we want to use a different key for interacting with different buttons? I'll add another export variable to the interactable script to store the input action with the default value set to interact. Then I'll update the input condition in the other script to use this prompt action instead. This way we can set custom input actions for each button from the inspector. However, now the issue is the player won't know which key to press. Hmm. Instead of using the prompt message, I'll define a new function called getPrompt that finds out the key associated with the input action and returns the prompt message attached with the key input. Now, I'll update the interact ray script to use this function to set the prompt message and there we go. The player can now see which key to press to interact with the buttons. Ok, it's all nice and dandy but printing to the console isn't all that useful. I'll define a signal near the top of the interactable script and replace the print call with this code to emit the signal. Notice the signal also passes the body reference. We might not use it in this video but this could come in handy in quite a few cases. With the interactable system complete, it's time to show a few different ways we can use it. Let's make a button play a sound when pressed. For that, I recorded this audio clip of me pressing a keyboard button. Word. Being lazy can be useful sometimes, you know. I'll add an audio stream player 3D to the button scene, set the stream to the audio file we just imported, and remove the script from the button. Instead, I'll attach a new script that extends the interactable class. From the node tab beside the inspector, I'll select the interacted signal and connect it to the script. In the function, I'll play the audio. Simple as that. And we can now make a clicking sound in game by making a clicking sound in real life. Let's make something a bit more complex. I modeled this door in Blender, which I then animated using an armature, having both an opening and closing animation. I'll export it as a GLDF and import the files and textures in Godot. I'll open the GLDF as a new inherited scene and copy the door armature as well as the animation player nodes. Then I'll create a new scene of the type node 3D, rename it to door and paste the nodes we just copied. To add collisions, I'll select the skeleton node, add a bone attachment to it, rename it to bone attachment left and select the left bone from the inspector. Then I'll add a static body as a child to the bone attachment and a collision shape as a child to that. Lastly, I'll do the same for the right and top bone. After that, I'll add an animation tree node to the door scene and in the inspector, I'll set the tree root to a state machine and assign the animation player node. In the animation tree dock, I'll add both the door close and door open animations. I'll connect the start node to the door close node. Then, I'll set the transition to at end, auto advanced to disabled 
and connect both the close and open animations to each other. Lastly, I'll attach a simple script to the door and save it as door.gd. The script stores a reference to the street machine playback, which I'll set in the ready function. Then there's an isOpen variable whose value is toggled in the toggle function. And based on this value, the playback travels to the appropriate animation node. Now, all that's left to do is to instantiate the door in the main scene, position it correctly, and connect the interacted signal of a button to the door's toggle function. With that, you have a door that can be toggled open and closed with the click of a button. Well, actually two if you count the keyboard button as well. Alright, time to escalate the situation. Wait, is it escalate or elevate? I'll create a new scene of the type node 3D, rename it to moving platform, you know the deal. Now, I'll first add a character body, copy a platform mesh I made in Blender, add a collision shape, and set it to a box fitting the mesh. Second, I'll add a static body, copy the rail mesh, then create a tri-mesh collision sibling. Lastly, I'll add a path 3D node, add two points at roughly where I want them to be, and from the inspector, set the position to these values, making sure to set the up vector enabled to false. Then, I'll add a path follow node, and add a remote transform node as a child of that. With the remote transform node selected, I'll assign the character body to the remote path. I'll test to see if it works by changing the progress ratio of the path follow from the inspector and it looks like the platform is rotated. We can fix it by just rotating the remote transform node. Lastly, I'll add a script to the moving platform, you know the drill by now. In the script, I'll add a reference to the path follow, a variable to store the target offset and a variable to store the tween, which we'll use to animate the platform. Then, I'll define a toggle function that toggles the value of the target offset between 1 and 0, kills the tween if it's already running, creates a new tween and animates the progress ratio of the path follow to go to the target offset in a duration of 4 seconds. Perfect. Lastly, I'll instantiate the moving platform in the main scene, position it and instantiate a button near it. Connect the button's interacted signal to the platform's toggle function. Alright, this works fine, but what if I want the button to be on the platform? Well, for that, I'll instantiate a button in the platform scene, connect the signals like before and voila. Move around the platform to your heart's content. Having multiple buttons toggle the position of the platform alone has a ton of potential for making puzzle levels. But what's more, you can position the path points any way you like and the system just works fine. Okay, one more really common interaction found in a ton of games is collecting stuff. Like heart containers, or keys, or food items, or keys, or weapons. Wait, did I mention keys? I'll create a new scene with a rigid body root and rename it to keycard. I'll add a keycard mesh and a collision shape, just like the last gajillion times. Make sure to make the collision shape a bit bigger, otherwise Giro just makes it clip through the floor on the slightest touch. Then, I'll save the scene and attach a script to it, making sure it inherits the interactable class and has an empty template. I'll set the prompt message and connect the interacted signal to the script. In the code, I'll set the game state's key value to 1 plus the previous value and call QFree. This will essentially delete the object after we interact with it. Before we test it, let's define the initial value of the key in the game state, or else Garot would complain when it tries to add 1 to nothing for the first time. Oh, and don't forget to instantiate the keycard a few times in the demo scene. Okay, with the game running, go back to the editor and open the remote scene. Select the game state node and in the inspector, you should see the current value of the state variables. Back in the game, I'll walk over to the keycard and collect a view. Observe how the count increased back in the inspector. Now, if you want, you can add a UI element to show the count of the keys using a single line of code. Alright, we have a key but nothing to open with it. Let's fix that. I already have this chess scene ready with a setup almost exactly similar to the door scene. All I need to do is change the root type to an area 3D node and add a collision shape, 0.1 units bigger than the static body. I'll save the scene and attach a script to it, again inheriting the interactable class. In the code, I'll start by getting the playback just like we did for the door. Then I'll set the prompt message and connect the interacted signal. I'll define a variable to show the state of the chest and in the signal function, I'll add a condition to check if it's not already open and if the game state has at least one key. If so, I'll set open to true. Play the open animation, decrease the key count by one and lastly set some value in the game state to true. This would depend on your use case and actually should be an export variable if you want to have custom items in each chest.
Now, in game, the player can try to interact with the chest and nothing happens. But if you collect a key card and try again, the chest opens. Nice. The one thing bothering me though is that the prompt message is still shown after we've opened it. Let's update the interactable script to have a variable to enable or disable the interaction entirely. I'll start by defining a new export variable at the top with the default value set to true. Then I'll update the get prompt function to return an empty string if the interactable is not enabled. I'll also update the interact function to return without emitting the signal when it's not enabled. Lastly, I'll go over to the chess script and set enable to false after we're done interacting with it. With that, the player can no longer interact with the chest after taking the item. Okay, that's all I'll be teaching in this video, but the possibilities are endless from here. I hope this seemingly simple system helps you create even more types of interaction as long as you remember. 1. Make sure the object is an interactable or its script inherits from the interactable class. 2. Connect the interacted signal to whichever function in whichever object to make anything happen. And 3. Uh, except that. I haven't been successful at that. Alright, I hope you learned something from this video. If you stuck around this far in the video, you're awesome. If you want to look around the code in the video, you can find the link to the project in the description below. And if you face any issues or have any questions, feel free to comment them down below or contact me on any of my socials. As for your homework, I want you guys to create a basic inventory UI for the game. Could be anything, it could be like a Minecraft inventory or I don't know. Zelda? That, that might be too complex. Anyway, hopefully I'll see you again in the next tutorial, in the next month or next decade, who <laughs> knows. Really need to get regular with my schedule.